but to get it from the first council. Uh, it is great to have Dr. today. Uh, we're very, very excited for the conversation we're going to have. Um, I want to remind you to, uh, I want to remind everybody two things. One is uh, we have to, many people, we have more than 100 people, so not everybody can ask questions. So we're trying to take as many questions as possible. And second, this is on the record, it will be recorded. So I just want to make sure everybody knows that. Um, but maybe, uh, Doctor, we could start a little bit uh, with your story and your journey. Um, and, and first of all, and first, welcome you to Rwanda. Welcome to Rwanda. I'm sure this is your second home. Um, and maybe we could start a little bit the conversation uh, with your journey, uh, your story from Ethiopia to today. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Amakuru. Uh, so nice <laughs> to, be, to be all today. I'm, I'm picking up on my Kenya Rwanda. So I really want to thank you, uh, Yannick, and the Kigali Foreign Affairs Council for inviting me uh, to participate in this conversation and share some of my perspective with you all. Uh, I am very much looking forward to it. Uh, speaking to young leaders is one of my favorite things to do. And you know, as emerging global citizens, your tireless dedication to make the world, uh, not just Rwanda, but the world, you know, healthier, a more equal place, uh, it inspires me, it encourages me uh, to keep fighting for the same. So, you know, as Yannick uh, uh, so, uh, annotated on a more personal note, my family just recently relocated to Kigali and we have enjoyed calling Rwanda home for the past uh, several months now. So we are incredibly grateful uh, to be in this very beautiful and special place. Um, so happy to start out reflecting on my personal journey. Mm -hmm. um, I was where you are now many, many decades ago. I was born and raised in Ethiopia. Uh, I lived there until I finished high school, uh, right after I turned almost, you know, ending 17, beginning 18. Um, I, lived, I lived there and that's when I moved to the United States. I was very lucky uh, to have parents that prioritized my education and encouraged me to be myself and to pursue my interests. Uh, from very, very early on, I've been interested in health. Uh, equitable health access and medicine and justice. Uh, so that ability to get education and have autonomy over my body and my future absolutely changed my path uh, in life. So um, when I was 18, I was fortunate to get the opportunity to study in the US. Um, I went on to pursue my law degree and medical degrees and a career as a reproductive endocrinologist. You know, I grew up uh, witnessing a lot of inequity, especially around women and women and girls, uh, and seeing firsthand many young people who were sort of in my cohort, sort mm -hmm. of dropping out, right? Like you start school and you move forward and all of a sudden, like your peers are not in the mm -hmm. same sandbox and you start asking and you find out, oh, she got married, oh, she had a baby. Not that those things are not important. I, I, I don't want you to get me wrong there fundamentally important, right? Like that's sort of the, the, those, that's the path through, you know, society. Uh, yes. But not doing that without your choice and not doing that when you're not ready are things that hold young people back, not just women. So sort of that shaped me to become a fierce champion to justice and equality, particularly access to sexual and reproductive health and rights that I felt like were the key to helping women and young people stay the course. Um, so I personally know how fundamentally bodily autonomy is to my liberation and, and justice. So that is that is sort of what I advocate for and that's what I've been doing. That's very interesting. So you, you just mentioned that you started uh, the International Reproductive Health Center and, and, and a while later we could talk what drove you to start the center, you know, you're in the United States, you could have done a million things uh, at that time of your career, but why go back home? Why really go back and start something like that? You know, there was an article, um, so I finished my medical training in 99, and mm -hmm. when I was going around looking for specialty training, 
um, everywhere I went to interview, I told them I wanted to go back and contribute to, you know, the healthcare uh, progress in Ethiopia and in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, for the young people, you know, which many of you are, you know, I finished high school and I came here and I was in school for 17 years, which mm -hmm. every time my kids hear, like they plug their ears and they're like, mom, we're not going to stay in school for 17 years. But I did because I sort of had like figured out what I wanted to do and what tools I needed in my toolbox to get me there. Yeah. Yeah. One of the stark differences I saw was one was the just the basic shortage of healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, midwives. And two, how reproductive health was siloed. It had become a thing NGOs talk about. Yes. For a number of reasons, it's been marginalized. And I felt like, one, I wanted to really train the next generation of doctors and nurses and midwives to not just provide health care, but also be confident, be compassionate leaders uh, in their communities and really integrate sexual and reproductive health services into basic nursing, midwifery, um, and physicians training. So I was very fortunate. Uh, you know, I always say do the right thing and money follows. I started out uh, going back and giving back sort of like one week at a time using my mm -hmm. salary to fly back and forth. Uh, but I was very fortunate to get my first seed grant of $250,000 that turned into a million, that turned into 20 million, that turned into 40 million. Mm -hmm. That allowed me to set up a center that subsequently um, worked in 13 universities throughout Ethiopia and subsequently expanded to Rwanda and Eritrea and now looking to expand to many more African countries to train very compassionate, dedicated healthcare providers who yes. care about women and girls, but also deeply understand the pain and suffering of their own communities. You, you touched two things I think I would love to follow up on, services and leadership. Um, you said, actually, I want to read this, you said leadership is not a position or title, but action and being service to others. What um, does leadership and, and being leader mean to you? Um, you know, that is absolutely true. I, I, I always say that to me, leadership is a tremendous privilege um, and it's an opportunity to lift up others. You know, what good is a privilege or power or platform that you have earned or you fought for if you cannot use it to dismantle inequality and really speak up for those who don't have voices. So I take this responsibility very, very seriously. Um, one of my very favorite quote is from my fellow advocate, the first lady of Namibia, uh, Monica Gengos, who recently was speaking um, on a forum that I heard her say, when you have power, always remember how it felt to not have power and be guided accordingly. So for me, Leadership and power come with that immense responsibility to speak for others. Um, one of the major responsibility of a leader is to help create more leaders. So, you know, in my field and also through CERT, um, you know, I sit in boardrooms and decision making spaces where I'm often the only, right? Like the only woman, the only black woman, the only mm -hmm. African, the only, you know, person of color. Um, and in a world where men, mostly white men, lead most organization in my sphere in global health, you know, more than 80% of global health entities are led by white men, and this needs to change. Um, you know, we need to see more women in decision making, especially in global public health, where 70% of the frontline workers are women. So I feel like, you know, we have to use this opportunity to elevate voices, expertise, expertise from the African continent. And, and also previously colonized nations. We need to meaningfully engage young people and every voice that has been systematically excluded. Uh, I really love that concept of nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. So we really, I feel fundamentally strongly and I'm not apologetic about my views. And I feel like we have to be unapologetic about ensuring um, this and in, in, in driving uh, international development and global health. So this is key to shaping just a bright future to everyone. And that's, that's why I feel very strongly about it. I feel very strongly about mentorship mm -hmm. and why it's so important to mentor as a leader. Mm -hmm. um, when you have power to raise others up with you, you just must think carefully and very intentionally about your plans to do so. And most importantly, um, 
we must shift that power to people, you know, within uh, communities that are fighting for this. So, you know, who's at the table and who's being listened to uh, is very important. So my call to you is never ever stop noticing who is or who is not in the room. Mm. Uh, so you touched a little bit, you mentioned twice, um, young people. What would be your advice to young people who want to make a difference in their communities to make the world a better place? Yeah, no. <laughs> so I first want to commend each of you uh, for the work you're already doing to be leaders in your spheres of uh, influence. History has shown us, you know, that it's often young people who rise up and, and demand progress. Um, I'm hopeful for the future because when I see young people like you, uh, it, it really inspires me, it gives me hope. I certainly were not where you were uh, at, at my age. When I look at you, you've already started your journey in a very, very um, powerful way. But I do have some advices, you know, as you go along the way. You know, first, um, you have to get comfortable making other people uncomfortable. You know, disrupting the status quo and addressing systemic inequalities is going to make a lot of people uncomfortable, right? I mean, Rwanda is unique in a sense, but in many parts of the world, young people don't have room. You know, um, experience, uh, age, there are these things, while there is enormous value for wisdom, young people usually get excluded. So you have to feel very comfortable to make people uncomfortable, but you must do it, you know, in a way that is inclusive, but never be afraid to speak up and, and, and use your voice. And, and you do have enormous voice, even if you don't realize it. Second, I, I want you to remember that change starts with you and how you choose to leverage your power and privilege, you know, says a lot. You know, you will face roadblocks, uh, obstacles, and, and, and at times people will doubt you. Um, people will push back uh, and tell you that change is not possible, uh, but I, I have never believed it, and I will ask you to never believe that for a moment. Uh, much of what may seem like common sense to you is still considered radical by many who are established in their careers and the status quo. So that is, that is really your power. Um, you know, we're watching that play out right now in Nigeria with uh, the NSARS, a major movement that began and carried out by young people. So change is always possible. Uh, and I want you to question those who tell you otherwise. Okay, that's very, uh, very interesting. So I want to turn a little bit of our discussion to uh, kind of what's going on with COVID. Um, we have been seeing different uh, impacts on different countries around the world. I, I want to, what, what lesson can we learn from the COVID crisis? What can it teach us about this crisis? Yeah, I think, you know, COVID has opened up our eyes. You know, as you know, it is continuing to change the world, uh, overwhelming health systems and laying economy slow, you mm -hmm. know, but it also, I think, has provided us opportunities to learn from. You know, the first thing that I have learned, and I think we collectively have learned in this pandemic, that it has not created disparities, but rather it has revealed them. In fact, you know, the deep uh, inequalities that have been brought to light during this pandemic are not anomalies uh, to the world's health system. They are unfortunately a built-in feature in the current design. You know, we have to remember health in general and global health particular has colonial roots. When we focus on COVID-19 as a disruption of essential services, I frankly worry that we run the risk of minimizing all the ways that our systems and essential services were already failing people. Um, you know, we have seen, for example, poorer health outcomes in COVID-19 for people of color in the United States, right? I mean, if you look at who is impacted and who's dying, it is people who are already being impacted in a system that was perpetuating structural racism. And for people who already um, were marginalized and vulnerable in just so many ways, 
vastly, you know, we've seen higher infection rates, death rates in communities that were facing poor education, poor access to healthcare. Um, you know, in other areas, we've seen very little protection and care for essential health workers who often, especially when you look at the frontline, frontline workers, not the doctors, but the community health workers, the essential service, uh, service providers, not just in health, but all across, these are communities that usually are come, come from low-income families, people who don't have access to health care, and tend to be mostly women um, and across the world. So whether we're talking about COVID-19, HIV, TB, malaria, or access to vaccine, contraception, or even chronic disease management, um, you name it, whatever it is, the same communities and countries are among those that are furthest left behind. So we really need systemic change and we need it now. Um, we should have been talking about these issues all along. You know, people have been screaming uh, about inequalities around the world, but I think the world's now forced to listen, right? Because COVID has become the great equalizer. So my plea is let's use this as a wake up call to change this flawed system. And ultimately it's not just about reversing the disruption of COVID-19, it's really about reimagining how health services are delivered and confronted like in and in in addressing the deeply ingrained uh, power dynamics, you know, across the world, across global health, my second takeaway from this is that, you know, a, there is a critical need to do better for women and girls. Um, you know, as, I, as we speak now, uh, and, I, and you may have seen some of the data that is coming from UNFPA and several other groups, women and girls around the world are facing just a number of deadly crises parallel with COVID-19. And it's made much worse by it, and namely, you know, restriction and attack and essential healthcare services and rights including sexual and reproductive health services, increasing just gender-based violence, uh, mental health crisis. You know, countries like France, where they have resources, women who were found to be at risk uh, of sexual intimate violence were being put in hotels. Mm -hmm. But when you look at throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, India, United States, where there isn't as much safety net and social protection, women are being locked with their abusers and they are projecting at least at least additional one and a half million unsafe abortion just from this pandemic. So that is 1.5 million women whose lives are at risk. You know, that is unacceptable. We will never accept that anywhere else. And it's in times of crisis, it's always women who are harmed the most. You know, women's rights, women's need, women's voices. So we bear the disproportionate burden and that must, must change, that has to change. So the pandemic has made it you know, painfully clear that if we don't take care of the needs of women and girls from the start, the ripple effect will be felt throughout communities. You know, families feel it, economies feel it, the entire countries, entire countries, and now the entire world is really feeling this. And my last and you know, third takeaway is that effective and diverse leadership is the key, right? So in many ways, this pandemic also showed us, and it, you know, first of all, I think there was this unprecedented opportunity to reset very problematic power dynamic. You know, for example, just to give you uh, data in global health, women and women from low income countries are about only 5% of the global health decision making. So we have a very steep curve to catch up on. So over and over, you know, we're seeing what it means to have quality leadership, right? But the flip side, you know, women in leadership are already translating into having women in leadership is translating into better outcome um, and, and fewer deaths. So from New Zealand, you know, of, of Jacinda Ardens mm -hmm. to Angela Merkel. And, and if you look at Africa, yeah, you know, Rwanda has incredible leadership with President Kagame, but you also see people like Clara Kamanzi who are making, you know, impressive showing impressive global leadership. Um, Yvonne Akisawyer, who was the uh, mayor of Sierra Leone, who kind of is going from communities to communities and working uh, behavior change. So these women have all, all kept their country safe by taking decisive actions, getting the right people in the room, 
listening to the science and being compassionate and very effective communicators. Um, so for me, the biggest takeaway is I think leadership that centers women is really, really, uh, really critical. Um, so it's good. I think we're creating space for indigenous uh, leaders for mm. women. Uh, the other big thing, I'm sure you all have been paying attention to what COVID has done is in global health, we have a lot of groups that fly in to solve problems. And because of the lockdown, that has not been possible. Yeah. So what we have seen is we are seeing indigenous African institutions like African CDC rising up, you know, in their own terms to drive solution uh, for the continent. So I truly believe this is our moment to rise to the occasion. Yes, COVID has had devastating impacts, but it also has shown us that there is opportunity for Africa to rise, for young people to rise, for indigenous communities to rise. And, you know, still amidst this overwhelming hardship, as Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the WHO, continues to remind us if we really keep sight simple things like, you know, of profound values like solidarity, love, equity, and justice, we will get there. But I think we'll also get there on our own terms by relying on our strength, by making room for young people, by building Africa's capacity, and by demonstrating what is possible when you have good governance, when you have good leadership, when African leaders prioritize their people. So I think uh, for me, as devastating as this pandemic has been, a lot of good has come out of it, particularly uh, for our continent. So what, and what gives you hopes in this crisis? You touched a little bit, but what gives you hopes in this crisis? You know, what gives me hope is, for example, what we've seen in Africa. Don't get me wrong. You know, Africa has a lot of problems, a lot of challenges, and we still if we don't do this right, we're going to be left behind even further, right? But Africa also has demonstrated what it means to have good governance. Africa has shown what it means to invest in primary health care. Africa has shown what it means to innovate, right? So young people are rising. Like I said, the inequities are, we're shining light in the inequities. So we're, we're being forced to innovate. Look, normally a disruption happens and we feel so incapacitated. You know, when you see how the world has continued to move on and deliver, deliver services, deliver global dialogue, move goods using digital, you know, uh, uh, supply chain and procurement. It is this pandemic is forcing us to innovate and to create around our challenges. Having said that, it doesn't mean that we don't have challenges, right? Like, you know, one of the biggest threats that Africa is facing right now in the world, but particularly Africa, is equitable access to vaccines, right? Because you know, we, we have been hearing today about, you know, Pfizer's vaccine that got announced yesterday that has 90% efficacy. Who's going to access that? You know, the very basic fact that the vaccine requires, you know, refrigeration, right? It's going to re require and it's going to be good only for 48 hours in a fridge tells you that this is not a system that is being designed to serve the most vulnerable. Yeah. So, but this is giving us, I mean, it's become a great equalizer. It's giving us voices. It is forcing the world to deal with this deep inequalities. People are rising and demanding equity and the world is being forced. If you look at the COVAX facility and ACT Accelerator WHO setting up to say, when we develop vaccines, unlike past epidemics and pandemic like SARS, where only a small subset of countries benefited from this, yeah. you know, we're going to see the whole world benefit. And mm -hmm. this is also a result of African leadership, right? The fact that it is not just random that this is happening. The fact that we have people like Dr. Tedros leading the WHO, we're going to have someone like Ngozi leading the, the World Trade Organization. Voices and representation matter. And we are seeing the impact of that in the policies and programs that are being developed. So I'm really, really hopeful when I see those things, despite the massive devastation we all have suffered from, from this pandemic. So I want to touch on something you already mentioned. It's, it's close to your heart. Um, how do we get more young people engaged in the fight for women's equality? Absolutely. Um, that is something that keeps me up at night. That is something that should keep 
all of us up at night. And frankly, it starts from just the very basic assumption that women's rights are not only for women to fight for, right? It is deeply ingrained in society and gender equality cannot be achieved by only women speaking up for this, you know, and this is absolutely something that is very close to my heart. The issues of, you know, gender equity and sexual and reproductive health, you know, are very personal to me because as I mentioned earlier, I grew up in Ethiopia. And when I grew up in Ethiopia, the path for women was narrow and sadly still remains very narrow. Um, you know, it's not unusual for women to die in childbirth. Uh, the ability to, for a woman to control her own body and fertility is a distant reality for many throughout the world, particularly in our continent. Um, it is because my family and my parents prioritized my education that I'm speaking to you today now. So how do me and you and all the young people around the world get to influence that? How do we shape that the ability for yes. a girl to go to school is not a heroic act, right? Like that is something yeah. basic. That is something very, very fundamental. But I know that we cannot and will not achieve that future and any kind of equity until women have control over their own body. Mm -hmm. So for me, that is the first step towards ensuring girls can get education, pursue their goals, make choices about their future, right? And there are a number of power imbalances and structural issues that are standing on the way. So for, you know, one thing, SRHR is often seen as a, like a women issue, like, right? It's seen as a political or sensitive. Um, and, you know, the flip side, it's, you know, when we do that, we enable discrimination. We say it's okay to stigmatize women. And later, financial hardships for individuals who are simply trying to live well. So I want to speak really directly, particularly to the men in the room, um, that SRHR is a fundamental issue of human rights, you know, and well-being for all of us, not just, not just women. Recognizing that SRHR is an issue of for all of us means we are normalizing it. We are normalizing access to contraception. We are saying it's okay for a girl to delay childbearing. We are saying it's okay for young people to focus on their education and well-being and plan their family. But in the flip side, you know, we, we talk about how, oh my gosh, talking about access to safe abortion is politicized, it's stigmatized. We compartmentalize this thing. So unless we put sexual and reproductive health as a basic essential ser service, mm -hmm. and unless you and us, all of us fight for that fundamental right for a girl to finish her school, to pursue her dream, for young people to say, we're gonna have a child when we are ready. You know, I hear African leaders talk about the demographic dividend a lot. If you look at the, what they call the Asian tigers, you know, countries that really leaped out of poverty, they just did not make education and jobs available. They also put family planning as part of their national strategy, yeah. you know, as their national health strategy. So, you know, it means really sea change in how society thinks about women's body and autonomy. And I think a dramatic shift in power structure, because that also has implication as to, you know, when a girl finishes school, right, when she pursues higher education, when she earns a salary, when she's not depending on others in the community, which means she not only have a seat at the table at home, but she also can be part of the political discourse, part of societal discourse. So you know, sort of kind of putting SRHR as something margin marginal really robs women and girls of their fundamental rights. And it's, this starts from, you know, things that women and girls need throughout their life, throughout their life course, from menstrual hygiene to sex education, to maternal health, you know, safe delivery to postpartum contraception and ending a pregnancy if that is not the right choice. So treating as SRHR just another vertical thing that is mostly driven uh, by donors is really on par with a focus on a single disease and yet another strategy for othering it, right? Like it's like something else and it denies its basic value. So for me, the need for HIV medication 
yeah. is no different than a need for SRHR. And the system should be designed around actual people's lived experiences. And it's people like you and I who can actually speak for that. So if Africa can invest in SRHR, if it can invest in job creation, if it can invest in education and health, there is no reason why we cannot take the massive young workforce we have and turn that into an economic dividend. But we have to look at it holistically and stop marginalizing it. And I think the young people in the room can play an enormous uh, 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 role in really destigmatizing and fighting for equality and fighting for young people and fighting for women and girls. And that is what we are beginning to see uh, throughout uh, our, our continent, even in places that were deemed to be very unfriendly for women and girls and adolescents and young people. So, mm. so I remain optimistic, but I really, I don't turn into our political leaders. I turn into young people to, to solving this problem. So I want, I want, I want, I want our panelists to join, uh, join us with questions, but uh, let me ask this one before we, we ask uh, Nancy or Melissa to ask the question. One is, um, what should be the focus of the international development in Africa? Yeah, I mean, I think post-COVID, mm -hmm. I really feel like there is an opportunity to reframe that narrative, this whole international development, right? That's very siloed, very vertical, uh, very donor-driven. And I think we need a flip model of, uh, of, of, of a paradigm shift uh, on how to do this. And, and for me, uh, and it's not because I'm talking to a group of Rwandese, but Rwanda is the model for that, right? Rwanda in so many ways has proven to the world that it will save its agenda. It will put its women in power position. It will have a holistic development agenda that would leave no one behind. Right, and it will do it on its own terms and not in a way that the international development groups or whoever it is will come and say, I'm gonna fund you in this area and this is my strategy. So I really hope and wish that as we come out of this pandemic and this post-pandemic era, we will reassess this whole development narrative and that we will put countries in the driver's seat and of course, we need governance, we need leadership. These things cannot happen in a vacuum. And that's what Rwanda has shown to the world. But when you invest in young people and when you have inclusive growth and when you set your agenda and when you get rid of corruption, then you can walk with your chin up and say, I'm gonna carve the path for my country, right? And others need to come along in a state of vice versa where international development is the difference between the haves and the have nots the ones from North versus South, a narrative that gets driven by people who come with resources and tell those that are most vulnerable what to do. So I think this reimagining this world where, where we are co-creating a world that is inclusive needs to happen on many levels. It needs to happen at the global level, but it also needs to happen at a national and subnational level where we are co-creating solutions and really leaving sort of the, the mantra of there is no, you know, nothing for us without us. So we have uh, let's see, 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna ask everybody one question, no more than one question, please. Just say your name, what do you do? And then ask a question. If you keep them short, amazing. Uh, let's start with Marissa. Uh, thank you, Yannick. Uh, so my name is Melissa and can you hear me well? Yes. I can hear you very well, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yannick. My name is Melissa and I'm currently working at Zipline International um, and I'm part of the global uh, regulatory team and focused more on the African continent. Um, thank you very much for this inspiring conversation, uh, Doctor. And, uh, it's, and thank you for giving us time to discuss uh, some of these issues and inspiring the youth um, to take more, um, to take more of their work and to make, um, I would say, uh, th this earth a better place. Um, so my question is more about um, um, your current uh, relocation in Rwanda, right? So as we all know, um, you just uh, opened the African HQ of the Susan Thompson Buffet uh, Foundation in Rwanda. So I just wanted to know uh, if, if you can just talk about um, uh, what led to that decision, why Rwanda basically? 
So that's a very good question. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you all of you for, for making time. I know we all are busy and trying to manage the complexities in our life. So thank you, Melissa, for that question. So it's, 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 it's a simple and yet complex question, right? So, you know, our foundation is looking to have more impact, being closer to the ground. Um, and we also are creating this paradigm shift. If you look at global health, it is really um, steep in discrimination, right? Like the model follows where donors give the majority of their money to institutions that are based in the US and UK and Geneva. They hire mostly people who sort of fly in and we are trying to create this power shift. We, we fundamentally feel very strongly that the people that are affected the most also know the solutions. So, you know, it's along that line, we wanna to commit to being on the ground, you know, supporting young people to create leadership space. So we're doing two things. One is we're shifting our resources and we're trying to, you know, collaborate with government, not create parallel structures, create space for civil society, build African institution. Simultaneously, we see the need to invest in Africans to enter the global health arena, right? If you look at, so one of the, the programs I'm working on right now is working with UNFPA, WHO, uh, Amina at uh, um, UN Secretary General's office to say, how do we create a pathway for Africans to, to enter these institutions? Because normally what happens is donor countries will come and put money to hire their citizens as junior program officers or JPOs. African countries or many of the, you know, colonized former colonies don't do that. They don't have the resources because it's quite expensive to hire and put somebody in Geneva or New York. Once that person has foot in those institutions, then they are the next to be hired. So because of that, when you look at this UN multilateral agencies that are supposed to serve the world equally, they are plagued by deep rooted discrimination. So we're really trying to figure out how do we solve this? So for me, Rwanda made sense in so many ways, uh, but there's also a personal component, right? When, you know, the last four years have been enormously difficult in the United States for people of color. So for those of us who have roots in Africa, we have started asking the question, what are we doing here? Like, yes, there is opportunity for education. Yes, there is opportunity for this, but we are reminded on a daily basis that we don't belong here. And then frankly, if you look at the talent, if you look at the, the, the wealth of educated diaspora, you know, throughout the US and you find a way to bring them back, to bring them back in such a way they are not giving up, you know, they may not be able to live life, you know, with very six digit salaries, what have you, but most young Africans that I speak to are really looking for a decent means to provide for their family, have peace and security and contribute for the growth of Africa. So, you know, when the George Floyd killing happened as a mother of young black boys, 19, 17 and 15, I started, I have been, you know, watching, you know, Trayvon Martin and all these young people getting killed. But the fact that a, a black man was killed in broad daylight while everyone was at home watching live on TV, just sent that shocking wave throughout my body saying, you know, my kids are next and I need to get out of here, right? So it worked out that, you know, we were thinking of relocating to be close to the work but when this happened, it wasn't hard for me because I was looking for a place. Okay, look, you know, I'm from Ethiopia and I, I, in the ideal world, I would have loved to be in Ethiopia, but Ethiopia is plagued with its own tribalism, right? So when the world is trying to move away and we are trying to move away from ethnic politics to being global citizens, we have countries in Africa that are still fighting tribal war, right? So I was looking for a place it is really Wakanda, right? Like I was looking for that place. Where can I be to do work? Where I have peace and security, where I have a sense of belonging, where I can have impact, where my kids won't feel like second class citizen, but I have modern day technology. I will remain connected. 
everything I need is at my disposal. So literally it wasn't, I mean, you know, so I will describe and people will say, are you moving to Geneva? And I'm like, no, I just told you I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to move to a place where I, I belong, right? Like where yeah. I'm not gonna be a second class citizen. So that was probably one of the best decisions I've ever made. I literally, like the air I was breathing got lighter, not because of the quality of air alone, but the fact that, I wasn't reminded every day that the police siren behind me could turn my faith into news, right? Or my children. Um, it's a one year move, but I have a feeling uh, already just in two months that it may be uh, longer than that. And I think I, I, at least my family's planning that we think this, this, this is gonna be our permanent second home. So good. Um, so Nancy, you have a question. Okay, I'm Nancy Ndekwe and I work with the Bridge Career Services and that pretty much uh, is a staffing and recruitment company, but we also place diaspora into jobs back on the continent, especially in Rwanda for Rwandans. Um, so my question to you, because looking at the demographic of the people on the call, the majority of them is youth and aspiring people. So my question to you is, what is your idea of success and how do you see that happening for us Africans in the future? So that's, thanks Nancy, that's a quite a complex question and you can define success in so many ways, right? Um, for me, success is not individual. Partly it's because of my upbringing, but I fundamentally believe for those of us at this table, you know, uh, to whom much is given, much is expected. So success is when we uplift others. Success is when the stuff that we take for granted is a reality for so many, and there is no reason why that cannot be. When, when I see African youth, right, just the lack of basic things holds them back. Just basic things like communication, right? Like how to present yourself buttoned up, unfortunately, like basic things. So the kind of work Bridge Rwanda is doing, right? Like, so for me, success is you take what you have and do it at scale and you uplift people as you go. And success for me, frankly, is when I see Africans solving Africans problem and constantly stop relying on a person who is an outsider, who does not have as much knowledge, as much expertise as you have, are going to be somehow solving your problems because of the color of your skin. We have to free ourselves from this colonial mentality. So for me, again, when I see, you know, there is a lot of work that needs to be done in Rwanda, get me, don't get me wrong. And I really think the kind of work Bridge Rwanda is doing is what we need. You know, one of the things, I, I'll be very frank with you, right? Like for the people who are watching this, one of the stuff that I'm struggling with is people don't have a sense of urgency, right? Like you go in and they are still so relaxed. In a way, it's good, right? Because it's sort of, you rush and rush and rush, you want to slow down. But like, you know, I go to the stores and I go to, and I'm just like, do you want me to put that on the shelf for you? Like, you know, like they're literally chill. They're sitting there. They are quite relaxed. How do we create, when you see what Rwanda has, has achieved in 26 years, imagine what the next 10 years could look like, right? If we can activate people to take an active role and not only just for Rwanda, amplifying that throughout Africa. So for me, success is waking our people up, nudging them that the solution relies within us and not from outside. And those that are in place of power and privilege, not forgetting where they came from and lifting people as we go along and reaching consensus collectively that we are the people we're waiting for. It is not gonna be somebody else and no one, it doesn't matter who's in the White House. You know, whether it's Trump or Biden, frankly. Yeah, day to day for Black people in the U.S., there may be a difference. But when you look at global policy, at the end of the day, countries are going to align, especially Westerners, and look for their geopolitical interests. So I think for us, success means us getting up and defining our own solutions. Success means lifting each other up and each of us turning around and saying, OK, I know where I came from and I know what path I traveled. What is it going to take for me to lift additional 10 people and help them get where I am, but help them not forget where they come from? So that is sort of my, my metric success is very different from most people. 
Thank you. Uh, uh, Sharon, you have a question? Can't hear you. Oh, great. Hey, everybody. Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you, Yannick, um, and thank you, Doctor, for the amazing presentation. My name is Sharon Watamudiza, and I work for a company called Countable. We are specifically specialized in trade supply chain and technology. Um, so it's really great to hear you speak based on the field that you're in right now, which is quite complex given the recent circumstances with COVID. Um, so one of my question being based on procurement and <laughs> supply chain, is understanding the complexity of data and, and data infrastructure and technology infrastructure in Africa in general. Um, we have learned that we have, especially in Rwanda, we have focused a lot on preventative methods, um, which is basically training service workers, engaging more people to facilitate uh, knowledge, local knowledge based on treatment, not necessarily treatment, but a preventative method on treatment before necessarily any type of had cause um, for diseases, but we also understand the large gap that's in our systems or in our markets that's based on manufacturing of medical, uh, which is very critical. So my question is, um, given your experience and your current work, um, how do you for, and I know there are some emerging you know, companies that are focusing a lot on supply chain, we have supply in Rwanda. Um, but I also understand given my work experience in this field, there's a huge gap in system infrastructure um, across continent, uh, across the countries in the continent. I'm wondering how you foresee um, the infrastructure of technology, but also medical, um, especially when I'm talking about like, you know, understanding the ground and knowing that we have to create solution to our problems. Um, I'm wondering how in your discussion you foresee technology infrastructure based on supply chain, but also the manufacturing um, of medicine um, and, and medical equipment within the continent. And I know that's a broader topic, but I think it's something that we, we should definitely touch base on. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. I mean, that is a topic that is, you know, that I live and breathe every day, right? Because yeah. <laughs> as I said, our uh, current system is broken and the pandemic is shining light. Uh, I, I, for me, you know, Africa needs to develop itself. Uh, while we're going to continue to rely on our friends and partners in the development world, we have to figure out a way how to use that to catalyze change, right? Right now, we have a completely dependent methodology. Um, the fact that countries like Rwanda, uh, in, 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 you know, uh, invested in preventive measures was a good thing, right? I mean, that was why we're able to fight the pandemic the way we are, because we have a good primary healthcare system, we have vaccines accessible. Uh, we have we have good surveillance for infectious outbreaks. But what that means is it has to come at the cost of something. And I think the point mm. you're raising is it is also we have not paid attention for tertiary care. I mean, if you look at Rwanda, some of the work I'm doing right now with King Faisal is to say how can we stop the hemorrhage of people who the resources going abroad to get care? Things that that, that should happen in house. But that also has a systems component, I think is what you're trying to figure out because it's not only training surgeons, it is getting access to commodities, uh, to supplies, to medical equipment. The current model is heavily reliant on donors like Gavi and Global Fund giving us not only the resources, but bringing the resources, right? So when you look at the amount of money that gets spent in Sub-Saharan Africa, on access to drugs, access to diagnostics and therapeutics. It's in the trillions. Mm -hmm. And the biggest money expenditure is out of pocket. It's government and then out of pocket. Donor money is very, very small. So how do we use that money for catalytic change? And instead of having, so what happens is all donors give money to Global Fund or Gavi, you know, to, to get HIV care. Then they go and buy very expensive drugs from Sanofi and Pfizer, their own companies. And they, we pay for the supply chain. And of course, yeah, we're grateful our people are getting access to drugs. 
But what about giving us the money so that we, we set manufacturing? How about Africa mm -hmm. setting up its own pool procurement, right? Regional, like not everyone can import. There is economy of scale. So instead of like, you know, the countries that have wet ports or dry ports cooperating and saying, how do we set up our own negotiation, right? Because it's not a small token that the governments are spending to procure drugs. How do we, so the large, there was a very funny McKinsey study that came out about five or six years ago, uh, you know, commissioned by donors, where they concluded Africa is better off importing drugs from China than building its own manufacturing, right? So these are kind of the really deep-rooted colonial approaches that we have to uproot. And right now, um, we have many initiatives under the leadership of African Union to see how do we use the digital infrastructure? How do we use the African Continental Free Trade Agreement to create a platform of shared procurement? How do we look at starting manufacturing basic things like IV fluid, gloves, you know, PPE. And again, one of the things the pandemic accelerated is that, right? Because we couldn't rely on the global supply chain system. You know, goods that were being shipped from China to Brazil were being diverted in Europe, right? So what happened was Ethiopian Airlines emerged as the trusted carrier to take the goods from one destination to the other. So I think, again, the pandemic is shining light that we can't sustain this dependency that we have to solve our problems. And I think drug manufacturing, vaccine manufacturing, look, we're looking at vaccines that require transport, cold chain for transportation, right? How do we solve, how do we innovate around that? And, and I think hopefully what we're gonna see with the leadership of African Union, with the leadership of uh, indigenous institution and our leaders holding others accountable, we are beginning to see a paradigm shift. But there is the other, half of the puzzle, right? We have to have better leaders. We have to root out corruption because there is no way we can sit at the global forum and ask for those things if half the things gonna come into our country are being siphoned at airports. Mm -hmm. If corruption is right, because that then becomes very easy to propagate the stereotype about Africa not being able to stand on its feet. So I think working on governance, working on good leadership, working on inclusive growth, but you're absolutely right, Sharon, that the, 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 the root cause is going to be starting manufacturing, starting pool procurement, starting a better supply chain distribution that is based on the digital economy. Look what, what is happening with Amazon. While the whole world is falling apart, Amazon is amassing wealth, right? Because they have built a platform that is not, that has the least disruption, the least. It's not like they are not disrupted, but they have the least disruption. So what are the lessons learned and how can we accelerate progress? But I cannot stress enough that we can't do this without good leadership and good governance. So we're going to take the last three questions. I apologize. I know so many people are sending questions, but you have to come back, doctor. There's too many questions. I have like eight questions already coming. But Esther, you have a question and Bright will go to you. So what's your question? Yeah, thank you, Yannick. Thank you, Dr. Sene, for really an interesting talk. So uh, my name is Esther Kodan. I work at the Next Einstein firm where I am in charge of policy as well as building um, an African community of scientists. So one of the things that we've really worked on for the past three years, and I think you've touched on some of those things, is how can we um, get African scientists who are knowledgeable, they're some of the best scientists in the world and they're young people and leading in their own fields to contribute in their own countries or in Africa in general, um, in terms of advising on policy and where science is, is going. And if you look at COVID, one of the most important thing that we've, we've, we've learned is we have to rely on science. We have to rely on, on our own people to actually solve our own issues. So one of that reluctancy we've seen from, especially from government is how to marry those two, um, the scientists who are in the lab, as well as the people that are doing policy making as, and, uh, and uh, deciding what the, the, the actual person is going to receive in terms of service, healthcare, 
whether it's a policy, reg any regulatory aspect that is coming on the ground. So what would be your advice on, on, on how to, to break into that field and how to merge um, contribution of different stakeholders, whether mostly on the scientist part, as well as on the policy maker so that they can understand each other? Yeah, no, thanks, Esther. That's a, that's a very good question. And we have seen what it means, right? The United States, where we just reached our 10 million uh, COVID infection, is a prime example of what happens when leadership is not guided by science. So the need to have policymakers understand science and use that, you know, and, and also for researchers and scientists to know that they need to translate their science into policy and evidence, right, is, is where we are seeing globally where the, the, the gap is emerging. Um, and, and first of all, I want to salute you for the work you're doing. I think there is enormous need around organizing African scientists. And I think what I heard you say is that you want people to contribute not just only to their country, but to their continent. And what we're seeing, you know, in, in Rwanda now is we have people from Ethiopia and from Cameroon and from, you know, many parts of the world uh, wanting to come and give back uh, because their home environment may not always be ideal for, for whatever reason. But I think thinking in this pan-Africanist um, umbrella and creating pathways for people come together through like the African Academy of Sciences, so you're an institution, but how do we get out of our silos? What I see particularly in medicine and in science is that we are really good at talking to each other, right? Like we are in our own silos, we generate the evidence, but we are built, you know, in fact, COVID has given us enormous opportunity to show how what we do is relevant to society at large, right? Because the way we measure our success, historically, our promotions in science, our tenure has been on the number of papers we publish, right? It's not by the policy change. It is by how many papers did you publish? How many grants did you get? Were you first or senior author, right? So the metrics has to change. So I think for me, COVID has created an incredible opportunity to showcase, like, what did the president-elect Biden did? The very first step he took was he put a group of scientists to guide the response to COVID in this country. So I feel like, especially through COVID, there is enormous opportunity. I'm happy to talk to you more because this is something I deeply care about. We are now beginning to fund public health institutions and scientists, but we want to do it at scale and do it in a way. And I know, uh, you know, Kiddis, who is at the uh, Gates Institute, has done a lot around the uh, global challenges. And I think where we need to hold partners accountable is that, you know, you hear about Africa leapfrogging, which I think is fantastic. The, uh, you know, technology has allowed us to leapfrog, but there are certain things you can't just leapfrog with. You're going to need institutions. Right, you're gonna need, especially for science to advance, you're gonna need the researchers. They're gonna need their benches. They're gonna need their policy labs. And those things you can't just leapfrog around. So I think we're gonna need a fundamental work. The other thing where we really need to do is we need to have our leaders invest in that, right? You see some investment around health and health delivery. You see some investments around education. But unlike even em emerging economies like India and China are putting a small fraction, like Brazil, for example, puts one to 2% of their national economy to go to science and innovation and advancement of discoveries. So until we start doing that, we're gonna let somebody else tell us what to do. So I think there is a lot we need to do around holding our leaders, accountable, holding ourselves accountable to prove to the world our work matters, you know, beside the silos and that the measurement needs to be not papers published, but how that discovery translates into saving lives and how it makes communities better, right? So there is a lot of work to be done on both sides, but again, I fundamentally believe this is a really good time to push for science and transforming policy and evidence into real life, you know, implementable piece of work that governments and civil societies can take and march with to conquer not only COVID, but to just recreate our reality for the post-COVID world. We'll take the last 
questions. So Bright and Kristen, maybe you could ask your question together and then she could answer once because we already 20 minutes over time. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Krista and Bright, please. Um, sure. Thank you very much, Yannick, and thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, it is it was inspiring to read about the work, the immeasurable work that you are doing at uh, the University of Michigan, but also your contribution to the global health sector in Ethiopia, and also all the things that you are doing for the University of Global Health Equity. When you read all that, it shows that you took really uh, huge challenges and huge responsibilities early on. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question would be, what kind of advice would you give to young people that are afraid uh, to take on such challenges or feel like they are not fully equipped yet? Thank you very much. Can I ask it? Yes. My name is Bright. I work with uh, Nancy at the bridge, uh, Bridge Surrender. Uh, I think we are privileged uh, to, to, to be here already hearing you and, and to be mentored, if you will. Uh, but there is uh, millions of other young Africans who, when they look around, they just see other young people who are trying to figure things out. So they lack the mentorship. There is not enough people to mentor uh, the young people on the continent who, who really need mentorship. And I think we can all agree that mentorship is perhaps one of the most important things for, for uh, to help talent uh, realize and achieve its potential. So I'm asking you, what, what can African, Africa do? What should Guada do? What should the continent do uh, uh, to help its young people uh, who are at a disadvantage in that sense uh, compared with their other fellow young people in more advanced countries? Thank you. Thank you, Krista and, and Bright. I, uh, uh, Krista, thank you for the very kind words. Um, I will be very honest with you. It's not easy. Sometimes people ask me and say, oh gosh, like how do you do it? You have four kids and you're doing this in Geneva, you're doing this. And I always say, I think we set our own limits. We can do so many things, but it comes at a price, right? And you have to be willing to, to make sacrifices and accept that you're not gonna be perfect at all times. You know. So whenever people say to me, how do you do all this? And I say, I do it, but not all of it at a time. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest disappointment my children had in me, and, and it was a risk I calculated and I accepted, was during Dr. Tedros's campaign, where I was literally gone for about, you know, for a long time, right? Like I was around campaigning, I wasn't home, I was missing birthdays, I was missing school events, but it was a calculated risk I took that I thought was worth taking for the gains we were gonna achieve at the global scale, right? So I think one is just be okay disappointing others and yourself if you are clear about the outcome. And two, I would say develop thick skins. You know, like you just, we need a thick skin. Doors are gonna be closed on you. You're gonna be so disappointed that despite your achievements, people are not gonna see you. They're not. You need to reintroduce yourself a hundred times. And there are times where you feel so defeated because you're like, wait a minute, like, how can you not know me? Like, so-and-so introduced us multiple times, right? But you just have to see beyond that. People are who they are. They are not going to stop and think about you. You're going to chart your own course. And you have to judge yourself by, as, as Nelson Mandela says, not by how many times you fail, but how many times you got up and just continue, right? So my thing is march on. And for many people, don't underestimate the power you have. And coming to Bright's question, you know, how do we do this? I really think we have an incredible opportunity through COVID and through technology. These things would never have been possible, right? Like, so I always have to get on a plane, go somewhere. Like, there is no way you'd expect a head of state to show up on a virtual platform. That was like a no-no, right? Yeah. Because the protocol would not allow by the time you go and sit somewhere and wait for a few hours. And now we just have to be bold. Let's organize. Let's have this virtual summits. We will name them whatever they are be called. In the past, those things were preserved for those with power and resources and connections. But now, frankly, it takes one person who knows another person to make things happen. It's, it's like two, three degrees of separation, but nothing is gonna stop this group to organize and invite a head of state to come and speak to you, a head of an international entity to speak to you. But when they come, don't let them just speak, commit to what they're doing. What are the one, two, three things? Like, you know, 
whenever people ask me, I always say they're fools. Like when they miss the opportunity to say, organize and ask people to commit. What are the three things they're going to do to help you? Get your voice, get your traction, get a platform and pull other 10 people along. So, you know, yes, we are disadvantaged and, and you're absolutely right. You know, there are people I will meet, you know, and young people and I will exchange and then they will start texting me, hi, like, how are you just saying hi? And I'm like, seriously, like, I want to say hi to you, but like, is this how you want to use me? Right? Like, because there are so many other folks you can just say hi to. So if you're going to get my time, you better know the three things or the two things you're going to ask me, right? But that requires mentorship. You're absolutely right. Young people need to be prepared on how they use those that are privileged to uplift them. And, and it has to move beyond like, can you pay my scholarship, right? Again, that is because they don't have exposure. And when they see an opportunity, what they want to seize is like, how do I get something out of it as opposed to how do we collectively grow? But I really think this post-COVID world we're trying to figure out has given you much more enormous power than you realize to convene, to get together, to demand change, to be at the table for policy dialogues, to have your voices heard, and then to mentor, right? Because look, we set up an hour and we bring 100 people, and then each of you will go out and have another session for 100 people. So, so I think it's incremental gains, uh, but I really think it's such a unique moment in this world, despite all the inequities and the difficulties that we're seeing. I think it's just exciting opportunities for progress, for young people to articulate, to be at the table, to drive policy. And you're already doing that. Um, so, you know, how do we take this and amplify it and support you to pull more young people to take responsibility? to shape the future and not look for a leader to tell us what to do. I'm your biggest, the biggest fan of your president. I call him my president. Um, the world need more presidents like that, um, who just, you know, think the power lies within young people. Doctor, thank you so yeah. much. Really, very really much. We appreciate it. You have to come back. We have 62 questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy time. to come in writing. <laughs> I'm happy yes. to come back, but it's really an enormous honor and privilege uh, to have the opportunity to chat with you, uh, to hear from you. I'm sorry we didn't hear from everyone. I still, yeah. you know, others yeah. that I didn't get a chance to interact with. Uh, hopefully, there will be uh, next time. time. And for the folks at Bridge, uh, Bridge Rwanda, I was planning to come and reach out to you and talk to you because. I feel like that's the kind of investment we need to make, take at scale. The young people I've met, like many diaspora go and don't want to set foot back, right? And 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 and, and what do they do? They they finish school and it was a forty thousand dollar job. The jobs are not there, so they are like clerks and tailors at you know banks when they can come back and actually change the continent. So I really think there is a lot to learn there. Uh, but hopefully, this is the beginning of uh, a continuing relationship and dialogue. And thank you for the honor to talk. Thank you so much for that, Doctor. Have a wonderful night. You too. Thank you. Right. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. Have a good one. Bye.